Welcome to Building Resilience, a podcast by Hatch for insights around risk management for sound business practices. I'm Joelle Pang. And I'm Mark Zane. Your hosts for today's episode. Last episode, we had Dr. Johan Detoit with us. We discussed operational integrity on keeping operations safe. Today, we have Matthew Kramer as our guest. Matthew Kramer is a global director in our advisory team here in Canada. And Matthew has spent the last 15 years working in pyrometallurgical and other heavy industry environments as an operational leader and consultant. He's passionate about implementable risk reduction programs and has spent the last four years with one of our large global mining clients developing and implementing catastrophic risk management programs. And in today's episode, we're going to be focusing on implementing these catastrophic risk management programs, as well as talking about high reliability organizations and the principles that they follow. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be uh, joining this podcast. So to start us off, can you tell us what catastrophic risk management is, when and why is it used? So I think in general, the world has a couple of different definitions, and that's because it is different to everybody. Uh, At the macro scale, we're talking about events that have significant negative outcomes, primarily around um, health and safety, environment, and community. Uh, We find that organizations are generally well aligned across the globe on what is material and what they consider catastrophic across that frame, where we do see some differences, just how big uh, a financial loss they're willing to take. And that's really related to the size of the company and the strength of the balance sheet, as well as the kind of business they're in. So it does differ from one uh, operation, country, client to another, where we're talking about typically more than one fatality type events that have a significant uh, financial, environmental, license to operate impact on the organization, and often a very large cultural and mental impact too. Uh, I think these are typically, because of the scale, very rare events. They're not events that we conceptualize easily. And they're also not events that we can easily categorize because they're so rare. They sit outside of the typical five by five framework, which differentiates them from the risks that we normally as organizations look at through a behavioral lens or through a HAZOP and individual process flow lens. These sit far more in the process safety management world than the behavioral world because of their ultra low likelihood and massive, massive consequence. And I think that's what differentiates them from the standard call it risk approaches uh, that many, many people and many, many sites are used to, is that as soon as we say it's one in 10,000 years, people stop worrying about it, when in fact they should worry even more because we're not actively managing those one in 10,000 events. Exactly. And it's becoming more and more important as we try to squeeze more production, more capacity, more efficiency out of our um, existing production lines and listeners may recognize we tend to overlook things that may be very important and altogether may lead to uh, an unwanted event. Yeah, Merton, I think that's that's important because certainly as we've driven economies of scale, the size of our process operations have become bigger. And as a result, the size of the impact when they're uncontrolled is significantly larger. And it's really put us in a different realm when it comes to the outcomes of these events. So given these risks, how would you approach evaluating the risks on site? And what are the so-called material unwanted events or MUEs? And how do we go about preventing or mitigating them? So I think the MUE is the nexus of the catastrophic risk, right? How does it manifest? How, what is the actual event that takes us from controlled managed to uncontrolled, unmanaged, and thereby negative consequences. How do we go about evaluating them? Diligently, slowly, methodically, and science-based. I think the key thing that I've spoken about in, in some of my articles before in my blogs is around setting up a robust process. You cannot rely on opinions in this kind of work. You have to have a solid uh, process that drives a diligent science-based evaluation of risks. This is more than just putting um, a bunch of experienced people in a room. It is really getting, when you do that, I think the trap we fall into the whole time is, is people saying this can't happen. 
because it hasn't. And those are two very different statements. Too many people make the mistake of thinking it won't happen because it hasn't, not because we have active science-based or engineering-based barriers that protect us from those risks. And so when we look for evaluating, we're looking for the science answer to what can happen and the science answer for how we stop it from happening. And we come across these type of approaches quite often when we, you know, hold workshops, facilitate conversations with people from different operations and areas is people tend to think, oh, this will never happen here. This would not apply to our operations. We don't have this problem. Yes, you may not have had it, but that doesn't mean that it will not happen in the future, right? Yeah, I think Mert, that that's, you know, we're talking here about the biases that people bring into into these discussions. And so often, as humans, we rely heavily on our experience. And the challenge is that very few people have a worldwide, multi-industry, multi-national, multi-process experience. And very few people live beyond 100. And so when you're talking about one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 year events, it really is almost stupid to expect someone to have that experience. Um, it's not something that you can gain by looking backwards. You have to look wide. You have to look at the history. You have to look at other industries. And you have to understand what is it? How did these black swans come about? And you have to park any of the biases that you may bring into the room or the false positives of why it can't occur on your watch or on your site. I'm pretty sure that 90% of the people who've experienced a materially unwanted event didn't see it coming. Because if they did, they would have done something about it. But they were passively protected, um, not actively. And a lot of this conversation is about moving to active, verified controls, whereas relying on either probability um, or a historical passive control, which you don't understand. And so diversity of view, diversity of experience, diversity of skill set are all required as you bring a team together to analyze the potential outcomes, the failure paths, and driving to that MUE. It's also critical to, as you mentioned, to follow this robust process that's established, you know, how you define MUEs, what your risk appetite is, to understand how you would qualify an event to be an MUE, and naming that MUE appropriately so that you're not jumping to conclusions in terms of, you know, naming an MUE as if it's a cause. So as an example, if your MUE is loss of containment, making sure that you know, you're know you not naming one of the causes of that MUE to be the MUE itself, because if you do that, then you'll miss a bunch of controls that you'll develop to prevent or mitigate that event. Yep, I couldn't agree, Mert. This is where the, couldn't agree more, like this is where the, the process is so critical because we do have to, as a group of people evaluating this, as a group of engineers and scientists, you have to ask how ad nauseum, and you have to get the answer to how every time. And you have to ask five questions parallel, five questions before, five questions after. How can this happen? What has happened in the past? And not stay at the 60,000 foot level. This is a devil in the details exercise of being down at the valve, the seat on the valve, the material in the seat on the valve kind of question as you evaluate what can happen. Exactly. It reminds me of the first episode with Dr. Johan de Toit when we talked about the group think and overconfidence. And uh, it's all, uh, Matt also validated that, you know, it's important to approach this with a robust process and be fact-based rather than opinion-based. One of the most common biases we see for sure is that protection, that confirmation bias that th I'm okay, we're okay. And it, and it goes back to we haven't done this and the fear of facing up to what if we prove it is uncontrolled? What do I do then to get it back in control? That's the challenge a lot of people struggle with. Absolutely. And once you have that cycle going, the, the plan, do, check, act cycle, then you'll be able to maintain this robustness and reliability circle. Yeah. And again, somewhere where, you know, the diligent process within that plan, do, check, act requires very strictly what people do. Astronauts don't skip steps um, when they're in space because the consequences are immediate. But how often do we skip the verification of a critical control because it's a one in 10,000 event? So I don't need to check it today, maybe tomorrow. But that's the wrong thing to do because tomorrow will catch you. 
Yeah, so tell us a bit about an example of a time where there was a catastrophic risk and what approach was taken and what the outcome was. So I think one of my, dare I say, favorite, but for the wrong reasons and often misunderstood catastrophic risk um, is confined space. And confined space is a well-established risk, but it's one which people do not often see as catastrophic. Uh, and they often see it as a well-known, well-managed risk. But my experience um, tells me that across the 50 or so audits I've done, we still have a significant difference in opinion and difference in approach into how to properly manage a confined space, and in particular, a large confined space. I think people often think of confined spaces as small cramped areas, which they often are, but there are also large confined spaces with multiple people in it, which require the same diligence and critical controls to be in place to protect the individuals inside. Um, primarily, the two areas that I think become even of greater concern when we're talking about large numbers of people, number one is rescue plans. How do you get 10 to 15 people out of a confined space if you need to in two to five minutes? That's a very different question to how do you get one person out of a confined space in two to five minutes. Secondly, the idea that the confined space, particularly large ones, are uniform is false. You can have a very dangerous part of a confined space and have an area that's very safe, um, merely because gas flows are not uniform, not homogenous. And so someone can be overcome a significant difference distance away from somebody else in that same confined space. And as soon as we have that, we have an escalating event of how do we recover, how do we help. And so we put more and more people in risk potentially. And so we focus heavily on personal, on, on preparation of the confined space, first of all, the isolation, the proper and complete isolation of that confined space, the venting and cleaning to ensure that we have, you know, correctly prepared the current atmosphere. And then a deep study on, on how the work will change that atmosphere. Um, and it's not only the work we plan to do, but the work that we might do unplanned. Because so often work plans change during the hour or two hours of repairs. And we don't revisit the risk assessment, remove everybody from the confined space, replan, re-execute. We simply get a cutting torch and start cutting. And it's those type of events that put our people at risk inside these confined spaces. And the last one, of course, then is to have a diligent um, rescue plan, a solid rescue plan that everybody's on the same page of. Not, we've deferred this to Mert and he will rescue us, but what is my role inside the tank? What is the other person's role? What is my compatriot's role? And how do we execute it together? And that means practice, practice. Not just thinking about it and writing it down, but actually practicing it so when the time comes, we can save lives. Right, and this approach also requires people from different backgrounds, uh, engineers and scientists alike, to be able to come up with controls, uh, lay out the, the minimum requirements from design to decommissioning. And, you know, one of our unique advantages here at Hatch is we're able to bring that cross-functional, cross-discipline experience. So if we're trying to establish controls for dealing with a, an MUE in the mining industry, we'll be able to bring people from other high reliability organizations like nuclear energy if they have an applicable process that's you know can be used as benchmark i mean uh, we have very unique examples i myself have experience in aut automotive and aerospace in one of the projects we were involved with I, this unique example that i gave uh, nuclear did actually happen where we brought in a subject matter expert in, in nuclear to help us develop controls for uh, a mining application and uh, this is how you develop robust catastrophic risk management and, programs, and, right? And Murda, I think that's a great example of the kind of diversity you must enforce. You should not be afraid of those questions, of the views of those individuals, of them asking those, you know, weird but difficult questions. I think that's important because it makes you think and reevaluate the basis on which you work. And if there's one thing that we need to do when we look at this work, it's to ask questions. It's to not accept the status quo, but to ask questions and seek evidence in support of the controls and the MUEs. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt, for joining us today. And thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. For more information on risk management business solutions, visit Hatch.com to learn more about creating positive change together.